And then we see here further in verse 10 to 14. He discovered that the Levites had left their ministry and had gone each to his own field because the people were not paying their tithes. The place where the tithes were to be accumulated was occupied by the son-in-law of the high priest Tobiah. There was no place to put the tithes and the Levites were not being supported and they were starving, their families were starving. And so they went out to work in the fields themselves. And so he got a hold of the rulers. Of course, it was not right for the Levites to leave. If the Levites had faith, they would have trusted the Lord and said, Well, Lord, if you want us to do a particular ministry, whether people give us the tithes or don't give us the tithes, we will do that ministry. We will not seek our own. But they didn't have that faith. And in any case, when Nehemiah came, he, first of all, rebuked the leaders. He didn't rebuke the Levites. Verse 11, he called the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? Look at the burden of this man. Why is the house of God forsaken? Why have you allowed the Levites to go and um, look after their own fields? You people should be supporting them. Then I gathered them together and restored them to their posts. And he says, you've got to obey the Old Testament law which says you've got to bring your tithes into the storehouse and support these Levites. And all Judah then brought the tithe of the grain, wine, oil into the storehouses. And then Nehemiah was very careful to appoint honest treasurers over this tithe. It's very important that in the house of God we have honest, upright people who are dealing with the money. And in charge of the storehouses I appointed Shelemiah the priest, Zadok, Pidea, and in addition to them Hanan, for they were considered reliable. They were considered faithful. And it was their task to distribute this to their kinsmen. Here was a man who organized this in such a short time. He came back and he saw these things all in chaos and he rebuked the leaders and things started moving immediately. And he says, a short prayer. Nehemiah was a man of short prayers. You know, he prayed briefly when he was standing before the king in Nehemiah chapter 2. And he has another short prayer in the middle of this. Remember me for this, O my God. He doesn't say reward me. He just says, remember me, Lord. Do not blot out my loyal deeds which I have performed for the house of my God and its services. He did not seek his own. He was willing. We could say, Lord, remember me when these people think that I am too harsh and too hard and too strict. Lord, you remember me and you know why I did it. It was not for my own name. It was for the purity of your house. And in those days, another corrective ministry that Nehemiah engaged in, verses 15 to 18. This was corrective ministry number four. And that was to restore the sanctity of the Sabbath day. Now, these are all Old Testament instructions that we're going through. The first was the uh, driving out of the Ammonites and the Moabites. And the second was the turning out of the son-in-law of the high priest, who had no business to be there in God's house, being an Ammonite. And the third was to restore the tithes to the Levites. And the fourth was to restore the sanctity of the Sabbath, verse 15 to 18. It says here, in those days I saw in Judah some Jews who were treading wine presses on the Sabbath. Now the word of God, it said very clearly in the Old Testament, one of the Ten Commandments was, particularly to the Jews, that on the Sabbath day they were not to do any work. And not only that, it very clearly said they were not to make their animals do any work either. They were not to load their donkeys and their asses and horses and all and get them to do work for them. They were not to do any work and their animals were not to do any work and their servants were not to do any work. But the love of money made these people work on the seventh day as well. They were treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sacks of grain, loading them on their donkeys, wine and grapes and figs, and they brought them to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day to sell. They were, their shops were open. They were making money. And I rebuked them on the day they sold food. He says, I don't care if it's food. You've got six days to do all that. He rebuked them. And then the heathen, the heathen of people were also taking advantage of this. And they brought fish and all kinds of merchandise and sold them to the sons of Judah on the Sabbath in Jerusalem. And he rebuked, first of all, the nobles of Judah. Notice again, he starts with the leaders. He says, it's you leaders who should be an example in this. And he rebukes them. He says, what is this evil thing you're doing? 
by profaning the Sabbath day. I, we we got to get a picture of this man Nehemiah. He wasn't a great prophet. You never hear one sermon that he preaches. He's one of those great men of God in the Old Testament who was not a preacher. Most of the great men of God in the Old Testament were preachers among the Jews, beginning with Moses and ending with Malachi. But here was one man who was not a preacher. He couldn't preach, but he was a man who feared God and decided to sort things out when things were wrong. Very important ministry in God's house. And he couldn't care less if a man was a leader or just a servant. Just the same to him. There was no partiality in him. And he knew that the problem always begins with the leaders, so he reprimanded the leaders. He contended with them. He says, what's this evil that you're doing? Didn't our fathers do the same thing? He gave them a warning from history. He says, do you know why God sent the Israelites to Babylon? Because they didn't keep the Sabbath. And now you fellas have come back from Babylon and you're disobeying the thing all over again. Don't you know that our fathers did just like you and God brought trouble on the city? And now you're adding wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came about, right on to verse 22, we read this corrective ministry. Just as it grew dark at the gates of Jerusalem, before the Sabbath, I commanded that the door should be shut. And they should not be opened until after the Sabbath day. He says, I couldn't care less if a man wants to go out or come in. The gates are going to be closed and nobody's going to go out or come in on the Sabbath day. And then, just to make sure, he stationed some of his own servants because he couldn't trust all those other people there. At the gates that no load should enter on the Sabbath day. And then he saw on Friday night, once or twice, the traders and merchants hanging around outside the walls of Jerusalem, hoping that they can bribe some gatekeeper and get in and make some money on the Sabbath day. And Nehemiah, he had a sharp eye. He went around the walls to see who these people were hanging around on Friday evening. And I warned them. And he said to them, why do you spend the night in front of the wall? If you do so again, you don't realize what I am. I'm not like these other fellows who were here before me. I'm going to use force against you. He says, then they got scared and they didn't come back again after that. Here was a man who was willing to use force. Just think how he would have lost his reputation if he used force on all these traders. But he couldn't care less. He only said, remember me, O God. I'm not bothered what these people say. Remember me, O God, the deeds that I do for your house. And so he says, from that time on, they didn't come. There was a man who was really wholehearted. And I commanded the Levites, verse 22, that they should purify themselves and come as gatekeepers to sanctify the Sabbath day. He says, now you people should be the gatekeepers. And don't let any of these people come inside. For this also, remember me, O my God. And have compassion on me, according to the greatness of thy loving kindness. You can imagine how delighted God was to have one man in Jerusalem who was wholehearted who couldn't care less for his reputation he lived before God's face and kept the standards and he didn't care whether he had to use force or rebuke the elders or do anything now we haven't finished yet you just wait and see what he does next it's even worse than what we have read so far according to a carnal understanding and then now the fifth corrective ministry he found that a lot of Jews had married heathen women. Now he had the job of separating these husbands from their wives. They had children. And the word of God had clearly taught that you are not to marry a heathen. All right? So he now turned his attention to this. Think of all the things that happened in Jerusalem just because Nehemiah went away for a short time. Just because he went away for a short time, all the evils came back in. Just like Paul told Ephesus, I know what's going to happen after I leave. Brothers and sisters, there's a tremendous need for strictness in the house of God. The severity of God is something that this generation of Christians needs to know. And he says, I saw that their children, verse 24, spoke half in the language of Ashdod. And none of them was able to speak the language of Judah, but the language of his own people. Married to unbelievers. Married to people who are Babylonians. And so the children suffering. And he says, look at him now, verse 25. I contended with them and cursed them. That means he brought the curse of God up, down upon them because God had cursed those who were disobedient to his word. 
and struck some of them. Remember me, O God, for this. And pulled out their hair. Remember me, O God, for this as well. He slapped them on their face and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God, you're not going to give your daughters to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Now, just picture this in your mind. One man and all these big shots and so many people slapping them and pulling out their hairs and saying, send your wife away and your half-converted children. That was the Old Testament law. But they were not to marry heathen. And then he gives them a lesson from history. Here was a man who couldn't preach much, but he knew his Old Testament. And he says, didn't Solomon do the same thing? Among the nations there was no king like him. What a king he was. He was loved by God and God made him king. Nevertheless, the foreign woman caused even him to sin. And now you are doing exactly the same thing. You committed this great evil by acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women. <clears throat> All I want to say is just a word of warning here. Don't try to imitate Nehemiah. Because God doesn't call everyone to that ministry. But there is a need for that in every church if it is to be kept pure. Then we come into corrective ministry number six. <clears throat> and that we read in verses 28 and 29. Here we read about him cleansing the priesthood. He first sorted out all the other people in Israel who had married the heathen. And now he cleanses the priesthood. One of the sons of Joiada, the son of Eliashib the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. You see, Eliashib had got his daughter married off to Tobiah, and uh, his grandson had gone off and married the daughter of Sanballat. And of course, the grandfather couldn't say anything when his grandfather had done the same thing himself. You know, we can't correct something in our children which we have done ourselves. And so they couldn't do anything. But this man, Joiada, was supposed to be the next high priest because he was the grandson of Eliashib, the high priest, but he had gone off and married completely contrary to the word of God. He had gone and married a heathen woman. And what did Nehemiah do? It says he chased him away from there. Imagine chasing the high priest with all his turban and his robe and say, Get out of here, you compromiser. And chased him away. And he says, Remember me, oh my God. I don't care what these fellows think, but just remember me, oh God. These people have defiled the priesthood. The covenant of the priesthood and the Levites, they call themselves believers, they call themselves elders, first-rate compromisers. Chase them out of here. This Nehemiah was the same man he was 12 years ago. He'd started this work more than 12 years earlier. Now he was much older in age, but just the same fiery zeal to keep the house of God pure. And blessed are we if we can keep the house of God pure like that. Year after year after year. There was no partiality towards the leaders. He just chased out this man who claimed to be a leader. We see a difference here between Nehemiah and Ezra. You know, in Ezra chapter 9, we read, we looked at this before, that when Ezra heard that the people of Israel had married heathen wives, somebody came to Ezra, Ezra 9 verse 1 and 2, Verse 2, they said some of these people have taken the daughters of wives of these heathen. Verse 3, Ezra says, when I heard about the matter, I pulled the hair from my own beard. And that was the difference between him and Nehemiah. He pulled the hairs from his own beard and sat down and wept. And verse 6, oh my God, he said, I am ashamed, embarrassed. And now he says, have mercy upon us. But uh, Nehemiah had another ministry. And that was to take action. And it's very wonderful to see how Ezra and Nehemiah could work together in this restoring Jerusalem and building their walls. Two completely different personalities. And that's something we see that whenever God seeks to build a church in any place, he brings together, just like in marriage, he brings together a husband and wife who are opposites. He brings together to build a church two people who are temperamentally opposites. So that they can build God's house and give a balanced picture of Christ in whom the glory of God was seen full of grace and truth. 
and in Ezra and Nehemiah together, not if you looked at them alone, but if you looked at both of them together, you could see grace and truth. And so it must be in the church today. And then, number seven, the final ministry of purification that Nehemiah engaged in, we read here in verse 30. Thus I purified them from everything foreign and appointed duties for the priests. And the, and the Levites each in his task. Here was a man who had an administrative gift to get a hold of these Levites and say, now you do this, you do that, you do that, you do that, you do that. He gave every single person a task. They were just floating around not knowing what to do. And Nehemiah got there and organized the whole thing and gave each person a responsibility to do. And so it is in the house of God, each person has a responsibility. And then he arranged for the supply of wood at the appointed times. He, think of the details this man took care of. He had all these other responsibilities on his shoulders. And yet he could think of, well, the wood needs to be supplied. Even that, he made sure that somebody took care of that. Because his mind was always occupied, not with how he can make more money or with his reputation before the others. His mind was occupied with is there something that's needed in the house of God? A little wood is needed in the house of God for the sacrifices. He arranged for that. He got someone to do that. He gave that, say, you take care of that. And at the appointed times. And he again says, remember me, O oh my God, for good. There's a beautiful picture we have in this chapter of what true corrective ministry is. And how Nehemiah fulfilled it faithfully. And again and again, he knew, I'm sure he sensed, people are probably misunderstanding my strictness. That's why you find again and again in this chapter, this phrase coming up, Remember me, O God, I'm living before your face. I'm doing it for your glory. I'm doing it for your house. Just remember me, that's all. Just assure me that you're with me in this, and it doesn't matter what the other people think. And that's the thing that gave him the boldness to stand against all those people. It didn't matter who opposed him. The walls were built and the inside of Jerusalem was purified and people were brought to the place where they could obey God's word. Now the sad thing is that after a few years you find by the time you reach the time of Malachi which we'll study next declension sets in again. Nehemiah has probably gone back or died or something. And once again, the others haven't taken a lesson. God has not been able to find another man to replace him. This has been the grief of God through the years. It says in the book of Joshua that the children of Israel served the Lord during the days of Joshua and the elders who outlived Joshua. And then the other leaders were just compromisers. And that's how it's been in the history of the church through the years. It's been difficult for God to find a Nehemiah. And that's why the walls are not built and Babylon comes flooding into Jerusalem. And so it's very important, brothers and sisters, that God, that we learn the lesson that God wants us to learn through this book and seek to fulfill that ministry in the church that God has raised up here to keep the walls high, to proclaim all the commandments of Jesus, to be exact in keeping everything that God has commanded, and to be willing to offend people, to hurt people, for the glory of God. To purify the house, to drive out the money changers, to drive out the merchants, so that God's house is kept in purity at all times. That ministry of Nehemiah, I would say, is almost the greatest need in Christendom today.